Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, uh, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are at home watching online. Uh, I'm Michael Shimada, the artistic director here at the Belfry, and uh, welcome to the final uh, before play of the season. Uh, today we'll be talking about Kindred, which is a new play that we've been working on for at least the last three years and is um, in the middle of teching and dress rehearsing tonight, previewing Tuesday and Wednesday, and we open on Thursday. Um, lots of information online. Uh, there's Upstage Magazine at the moment is, is uh, still on our website uh, for this year, and uh, the program is there as well, so lots of things to check out there. Uh, as I'm sure everyone here knows, Before Play was designed to provide information and insights on the upcoming plays. And uh, since the very beginning, uh, we've been blessed to have Gregor Craigie doing all of the hosting for this, uh, for this, this event. <laughs> and thanks to Craigor, uh, Before Play, uh, right off the bat, became a collaboration with CBC Radio. And these uh, interviews get rebroadcast throughout the run of the show, which is a uh, great promo for us and informative for CBC Radio listeners. Because of that, just a reminder to please make sure your cell phones are turned off so you don't make a guest appearance on CBC Radio. <laughs> and uh, aside from that, uh, I will hand things over to Gregor. Welcome. use that uh, cell phone reminder every morning around 5.30. It does occasionally happen on live radio. Welcome back to uh, the Belfry Theatre. Nice to see everybody. I'm going to take off my mask, and I think our guests are going to take off our mask for the benefit of you understanding what I'm saying. So no excuses as well. Our, our first director, or pardon me, our first guest is the director of this play. Lauren Taylor was born in Melbourne, Australia, and is making her Belfry debut. Lauren is a director and dramaturge whose work has recently been seen at Touchstone Theatre and the Arts Club. She holds an MFA in directing from UBC and is an alumna of the Lincoln Center Directors Lab. Please welcome to Before Play, Lauren Taylor. <laughs> to do the same thing. And if you don't mind pulling your microphone in. Pull it okay. Aiden, tell me when I'm, yeah, is that good? Great. Okay, great. That's good. Thanks for joining us. Hey, pleasure. On Thanks for having me. very busy us. weekend. So you were born in Melbourne. Did you grow up there or did you grow up somewhere else in Australia? <clears throat> um, up until the age of 10, I was kind of like um, dragged around the world by my <laughs> hippie parents. Um, but uh, yeah, so I lived in India. Um, Indonesia, um, Hong Kong, various other places, and then we sort of settled back in Melbourne from about the age of 10. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd grown up with a range of experiences and cultures, and um, English not as my first heard language. Yeah. So, yeah, I felt uh, very out of place, which is what sort of sent me to um, drama and theatre. I went to a Saturday morning theatre class because I was a bit of a misfit kid, I guess, and yeah, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> Did you know right away uh, for, from that young age, do you think, or was it just an interest for many years until it became a, 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 that much of a focus, a career focus? Yeah, I think it was a sort of existential need <laughs> at the age of 10, I guess, like just to sort of create make-believe and escape my brain and reality. And um, so I, I don't think I thought that it was actually possible as a career until... Um, I got to university and um, I, uh, I was involved in student theatre, which at the time in Australia was, was publicly funded and very well supported. And so you could go into the student union office and say, oh, I'm interested in doing a play. And they'd go, great, here's a space, here's a little bit of money, okay. you, you know, go to. And so there was a real sort of freedom in that creativity um, born of that, I don't know, that era, I guess. And uh, I directed a play by a um, Melbourne playwright called Joanna Murray Smith who's achieved some success in the States with plays like Honor and Redemption and um, anyway, she was young at the time and she came and saw it and she said, um, oh, I think you've got something. You should think about doing this as a career. And I, when I spoke to my mum about that because I was doing a general arts degree, mum said, you sure you don't want to go into journalism? <laughs> <laughs> So 
Okay, well, I, I think you did, a, you did all right going into uh, theater, actually. Uh, nothing wrong with journalism. <laughs> what about directing? Was that immediately obvious to you? I mean, did you, did you want to be the mastermind, if, if that's an okay term? Or, I mean, did you ever want to be on stage? Did you ever want to be the actor? Well, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Stephen can tell me that my acting skills are dreadful, <laughs> but I'm very enthusiastic about line readings. But um, no, I was, well, part of this Saturday morning theatre class that I went to all from the age of 10 to 18, again, a very free-form, low-expectation <laughs> environment, um, there was a casting agent uh, that came round. This would happen from time to time. And so the equivalent of the CBC in Australia is the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Company, and they were making a TV series. Now I'm outing myself. This has been a sort of well-kept secret. But they were making a children's TV series that eventually achieved a lot of success and ran several seasons, I'm not naming it, um, but uh, I was picked out of the crowd and told to go to a general audition at a big film studio and I was like completely, you know, intimidated and then um, we sort of started off with a hundred kids and then they sort of did this kind of survivor thing throughout the day where they kind of cut down the amount of kids that were left and then there was just six of us by the end of the day and then I, I got cast in a sort of recurring role and so that was my sort of first experience and my first day on set ever doing my first ever paid professional gig, I didn't know what I was doing, was a kiss scene. I had to kiss the main character and they were like, just go do it and I was like, ah. and he was like, you know, you're sort of 14 and gangly and dorky and he like I had the biggest crush on him too so that was like hell. Really no hell. Doing it in front of cameras. Oh yeah, no, it was great. <laughs> so um, after that experience, uh, I decided I didn't want to be in front of the camera. Not that it was terrible, but I just um, I was a bit bossy, and I liked um, I really liked the collaboration of working with people to make a thing. Yeah. And I still do, and so I thought um, that was um, that was a sort of better fit for me, just because I wasn't. I wasn't sort of comfortable in my skin enough to be a performer, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. I found that um, performers are actually quite um, extraordinarily focused and grounded people. Um, and, uh, we, you know, the opposite of what we think they might be. And um, I just didn't... I, I, was, I was just more comfortable sort of facilitating a creative process. So, yeah. Now, so you, but then you, you, we go back to university and you started directing and did, did that launch your directing career right away or what happened after you left university? Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah. It, it, when you start out, it's, you know, you, you go to everything you can go to, you meet everyone you can meet and you sort of try an apprentice and you um, make your own work and... Um, so I was doing that, and then I, after um, university, I went to grad school for directing, so I went to a, like, a specific arts college, and that's when I sort of thought, oh no, okay, we're onto something here. And then I commissioned, I sort of went out and commissioned a short play by um, a writer at the time who was achieving um, some notoriety and success with their first novel. Um, uh, called Loaded, and um, it was a writer called Christos Trolkus, who now is very famous for writing The Slap, which was mm. turned into an NBC series, but at the time, um, he and I were kind of still starving artists in Australia, and I said, would you be interested in writing a short play for me? And I put it on myself, and um, it was called Viewing Blue Poles, and Blue Poles is a Jackson Pollock painting in Australia that was bought in the 70s by the government at a huge expense and caused all this controversy anyway. It was a, a beautiful three-hander set in front of that painting and that attracted a lot of attention. Um, and so then that sort of led me to um, an offer of working at a uh, major theatre company in, um, uh, in Melbourne that did predominantly new work, which was my interest, new new plays and working with living writers. And um, that sent me to uh, the Banff Centre, the Royal Court, the Lincoln Centre Director's Lab, and um, my interest in working on new plays basically sort of started way back then. And I still love it. It's one of the most gratifying things I could do. I just, I, I love it. I love the, the it's, I love everything about it. Very creative. <laughs> 
it must, I mean, you're just making something brand new and, and, and collaborative, working with the writers and so on, and, and the actors, for, especially the first time. It must be one of the most creative things you can do in the theater, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, but it's funny, though, because it's sort of like um, considered creativity because you can't, um, it's not like if you have a classic and you're sort of going as a director, oh, well, I'm going to do my version of a doll's house and, you know, you can have flying pigs and elephants that come in and this, that and the other and you justify it somehow dramaturgically. But with a new play, you have to, um, or at least my... Um, my um, uh, perspective or ethical focus or whatever is um, very much um, that the writer is involved, especially for the first ever production, because none of us really know fully how, what it is, how it's going to be received and what, what this is and how it meets the moment, like the zeitgeist of now. And so this, this kind of event is really, really interesting because it sort of connects it into... Um, you know, where we're at as a, as a um, society, as a community. Um, and this feels, I don't want to use the word, like very, um, like a very full moment in time where coming out of this enormous global event. Are we out of it? I don't know. You tell me. Um, but, you know, we've, we've had to deal with so much over the last few years. And so it feels especially urgent being in the theatre um, especially because so much of theatre was kind of muted or shifted during the pandemic. So, yeah, I'm not sure how I got onto that, but um, no, I think it was I a good there. a good segue, and it leads me into asking you about Kindred. Mm. Uh, what can you tell us about it? I, I know you don't want to give away spoilers, but can you give us a brief introduction to to what we'll be seeing? <coughs> well, <laughs> um, it's um. It follows uh, the story of four characters who are um, parents to young children and um, uh, go... Uh, 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 and at the, the top of the play are dealing with separation and divorce and the pressures of parenting and what we call adulting. Um, and uh, the protagonist is a woman who um, makes the really difficult decision to leave her marriage to preserve her parenting and herself. And that is really, really tricky when you've made a commitment to, um, to marriage. Um, uh, and so she's sort of having to deal with and process that and what that means. And then her ex that she leaves is having to sort of deal with that and process that sort of rupture of that commitment and um, the expectations that that and challenges that that throws up. And then um, we sort of follow these characters' journeys as they, I guess, find uh, their kindred um, spirits. Um, but also um, some of the characters, the journey is also about self-discovery, um, learning about your responsibility to yourself and the rest of the world. There's a character that makes a pretty big mistake in the play and then goes on a bit of a journey of um, discovering uh, a, um, a, a humility that they have to embody, I would say, maybe. Um, yeah. And so I understand there's a, a mixture of drama and comedy in the play, and I wonder how, as a director, you approach that and try to bring them uh, uh, together as a, a cohesive whole. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, we have been trying to find the truth of the situations for the characters, um, and... Uh, uh, striking the balance between um, it's a play where the laughter sort of comes from recognition like it, like the, all, none of these characters sort of have the answers and um, they're kind of just doing the best they can like most of us in life and the skill of the playwright is that they just write these situations where you just go oh I've been there before Oh, I know what that feels like. I think I want to just like <laughs> crawl under my seat right now. Um, but then, but then there's a real generosity as well because then the the scene will morph and turn into this moment of delight and wonder. And so, 
um, or, or challenge. You know, there's challenges in this play as well. And um, it kind of feels a bit like life, but Michael described it as a fairy tale for adults, which we've really sort of taken that to heart in the production and sort of tried to, you know, tried to make it life like life, but with a little bit of magic in it. <laughs> Don't we all want that? <laughs> but also it feels magical when you um, connect with people or when you feel like you're really seen by someone. And sometimes, you know, we go through processes in our lives where we realise that we're, what we're running away from is ourselves. And um, so their characters in the play see each other and... Uh, face up to moments where they allow themselves to be seen, which I think is one of the most vulnerable things you could ever do. Um, and so working through that has been very interesting. I, I find that interesting. What about, you talked about the zeitgeist right now at the end, we hope, of this two, in, two years and, and counting pandemic and, and, and how it's impacted as a theater, you know, having to either be away from the stage or, or produce things uh, on the screen and so on. How, how are you feeling uh, about returning and what have the last two years of the pandemic been like for you professionally? Hmm. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, well, like everyone, I guess, the, you know, the, the shock, right? We, we was, we've been told, stop. <laughs> World, stop. Everyone, stop. Stop. Remember that? Remember that day in lockdown where it was like, okay, stop. And it sort of felt like, um, you know, like those those images of Chernobyl that you see. So I'm dramatising. I'm totally dramatising. But anyway, but you know where it's like you see like these abandoned rooms and it sort of felt like that happened to our lives where it was just like, okay, halt, halt. You know, I remember I was teaching at UBC and... I was given this email that we're not come, we're going into lockdown. We have to switch to online. Do you want to teach online? And we were like, "What is teaching online? What is that?" You know, and we had to go through that whole process. And so, it's kind of been like what they say in the tech world that sort of rapid prototyping. You know, they talk about oh, do things fast and break things, and that's called rapid prototyping. And I have certain strong feelings about that because I don't think once you break people, it's very easy to put them back together. So we're not going to talk about Elon Musk anyway. Um, <laughs> But um, but I think that, um, you know, there's something, uh, well, hugely humbling. We've all been through huge grieving um, for people who have lost um, people. Uh, I've been incredibly lucky that I haven't. But I think that um, in amongst all of the challenges that we've faced, we can't forget the absolute devastation of this pandemic and that, you know, for some of us it was an inconvenience and for others it's it's been an absolute disaster. And I think that I look forward to us coming together and figuring out compassionate solutions for moving forward from that. There's a sort of, a, there's an opportunity in that, I think, um, that, yeah, that's about changing structures when you're uprooted from something in the way that and given the shocks that we've had the opportunity then is about all right how do we want things to be you know how can we make this better knowing that we all need comfort ease and compassion and mercy at this time i would say so a lot of people uh, are looking forward to going and sitting and i know you can do it online as well they can watch the play online but but looking forward to returning to the theater and watching mm. this i wonder finally what, what do you hope uh, audiences take away from Kimberly. Oh, um, I hope um, I hope there's a sense of connection and release. Um, I hope that people enjoy it. Um, you know, sort of have an opportunity to maybe escape into the world um, and and um, have a good night out <laughs> together. Together, <laughs> like celebrate the people that they love in their lives and. Um, yeah, possibility, atonement, hope. Those <laughs> we, all sound great. <laughs> well, yeah. I was telling Gregor before, we kind of really, we're really looking forward to seeing all of you because the missing piece now, where we're at in terms of building the show, the missing piece is you, the people that come to see it. That relationship is so critical and I don't think 
you are told as audiences um, how important, how incredibly important you are. We can't play to empty rooms, we can't play to little cameras, we play to people. And that's the magic of breathing together and being together. So it's, um, it feels very exciting, yeah. Well said, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I know it's a very busy weekend. Thank you for doing that. Lauren Taylor is directing Kindred at uh, the Belfry. Our next guest is Alfredo Garcia, who is a Latinx PhD student in the Department of Political Science at UVic. He's the son of Salvadoran refugees and a first-generation Canadian. His focus is the mental health of men and the interplay of patriarchy and masculinity in our contemporary world. His dissertation examines the importance of men's vulnerability. Please welcome Alfredo Garcia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was going to shake hands again. <laughs> it's good to see you. Well. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Uh, how did you become interested in mental health of, of men, first of all? Um, I think it's always kind of been there in my family, uh, a bit of the background. So in my dissertation, uh, I first started, I was just exploring capitalism and mining corporations in Latin America. And a lot of people often forget that Canada is actually a big powerhouse in the mining field, in the mining area. At one point, 75% of the world's mining corporations, the headquarters, were in Canada. Yeah. That's because e it's easy to get onto the TSX if you're a mining corporation. But then I started thinking, hold on, I sometimes have first gen sort of exceptionalism, and I'm like, my parents are refugees from El Salvador. They survived the Civil War. My dad was a prisoner of war, he was shot by the Salvadoran military. Then they were. Um, illegal immigrants in the US because they had to flee and then they got refugee status in Canada. That's a lot of trauma. That's a lot of anxiety that you could be deported at any day living in the US. And these stories for me were just taken for granted. I'm like, yeah, that's just my, that's my life. Like my, my household is chaotic. There's a lot of love in it. There's people crying, there's people laughing, there's hugging. And then, uh, you know, this, this whole play is, is, is really about vulnerability. All the characters are vulnerable. And, Reading it, I was like, some of these men, though, they don't, they don't want to get vulnerable, so let's get vulnerable. Um, <laughs> then, uh, it's funny because I also know Siobhan. So uh, by the time I was like 27, 28, I met the person that would eventually become you know, the love of my life, but we're no longer together. And she was also an academic, and I'm, ac and I'm an academic, and we would just stay up all night just talking. And then that's when I really started to go down this path of men's mental health and masculinity. Because I think that there are also a lot of other communities of racialized men, not just Latinx men, uh, black men, indigenous men, that are going through a lot of the same things, the trauma in the household. And I think that it was something that a lot of men are afraid to talk about. However, I still hold on to a lot of these like hegemonic masculine sort of traits. I like to go to the gym. I'm kind of like a guy's guy. I, I still do these things, even if I am an empathetic or vulnerable person or if I'm learning to be that. So I think some people feel more comfortable talking and opening up with me. And so now, writing this, this dissertation, I'm like, well, if this dissertation can save a man's life or if it can save a relationship, then I feel like I've been doing my work and I'm, I'm helping someone. So it's also kind of autoethnographic. So at the same time that I'm trying to make these critical analyses of the world, I'm like, this is also kind of a story about myself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really quite enjoy the process. That's a great background. <laughs> and, and I want to ask you uh, particularly about the, the racialized aspect in a minute. But, but I wonder, first of all, how much you think the, uh, the stereotypes persist today, this tendency to think that women are more vulnerable and emotional than, than men, and this idea that men are supposed to behave in a certain way. How much does it still influence our relationships, our, our uh, male-female relationships today, do you think? I think, they, I think they're still there. It, it's funny because these questions, we've been asking them for a long time, you know? And it doesn't matter if it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even before that, and we're asking it in 2022. Time flies. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the question was in terms of vulnerability, right? That we think that women are often more vulnerable um, and emotional, but I think men are emotional and vulnerable too, but we express it in different ways. Uh, a lot of the times we just get angry and we punch drywall. <laughs> like, <laughs> funny story, my, my, so in my family, my, that's, that was the way that my brother expressed himself. He would punch walls and drywall. Now he does drywall as a living. <laughs> 
<laughs> kind of, I'm like, this, yeah, a creator is a funny person. You know, you know it's funny. <laughs> I have three sons, and a friend of mine grew up with three brothers, and she said, I guarantee you, by the time your youngest is finished high school, all three of them will know drywall repair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, I hasten to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, no, I think, I think, yeah, we have those stereotypes that, you know, women are more vulnerable and emotional, but we all are. We just don't really express it. We hide it, and that's actually quite toxic. And it leads to this implosion and then an explosion eventually that just does not look well when a man does it because men are still pretty, pretty scary sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and as you say, we've been talking about it for decades and probably longer. Do you see it easing? Do you see, I mean, do you think that it's improving even slowly over time? That's interesting. I think it comes in waves because um, recently I was looking at the statistic that um, in the U.S., uh, for example, suicide rates for men had been dropping, but for uh, Latin American men, it had in actually increased. And so that was very, I'm still trying to figure out why would that would be, but obviously it is just like this machismo, this, you know, this, we have to be hyper-masculine, but again, like that's kind of been the story for a long time. So. I don't know, it eases, but at the same time, there's, there's other things. Obviously, COVID was a, a yes. kind of factor that kind of just, everyone's mental health and wellness kind of deteriorated. But I think it has been easier. I think also um, Gen Z is a, is a, you know, the up and coming scholars and thinkers, they're a lot more open and empathetic than I think millennials and boomers and Gen X. And I think a lot of younger men today are, are kind of feel like they can express themselves Especially on things like TikTok, I, I I watch a lot of TikTok nowadays, and and yeah, I mean just like the way that the uh, Gen Z dresses too, with the way that they express themselves, like through fashion sense. I'm like, that's cool. Like I, um, I think of people as kind of like Jaden Smith, who can who openly just wears a skirt. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like you look dope, and but I couldn't really, I didn't feel comfortable doing that when I was younger. Yeah. But maybe today I, I probably could, because I'd be like, hey. Whatever. And, and what about the racialized aspect of it, the, the, the indigenous and, uh, and black and Latin communities and the trauma you talked about, mm -hmm. which, is, which is still influential through generations? How do you think that I influences uh, both vulnerability and the, the male stereotype and male behavior? That's a good question. I mean, I think uh, for me, uh, if I can speak from experience, I just didn't ever really want to show that I, okay, for, for example, I'm first gen and my parents went through all this trauma and I, for me, I always held these ideals that you went through, you sacrificed so much that I can't break down, you know, because like you provided me this amazing life in, in Canada and I, I can't like let you down and I can't see you, I can't let you see me failing or, or being vulnerable and I think a lot of, I think, racialized communities are like that because we get the chance to do things that our parents didn't do. And I think that really just affects how, yeah, we navigate the world. Do you have any insights into uh, mixed uh, race relationships uh, in, in today's world where there's so much more common in today's multicultural world? Yeah, um, well, I was in a mixed race relationship and it was at times kind of difficult, but it was also a very lovely one because again, we were both academics and we both came from a background of kind of like sociology. And so this is why I kind of, reading the play, I kind of laughed a little, because you're supposed to try to figure out, I, I think it's open-ended as to who the people are, but Elise is this white woman with this retail shop and she kind of just appropriates all these, you know, different things from different cultures. But reading it, I'm like, I think that this is a, a, a white person, a white woman, this, this savior complex. But in my mixed race relationship, it was actually, it was goals, it was, we were, it was like a powerhouse because I don't know what it's like to be a white woman and also being a woman in society is difficult. I don't know what it's like to go to the bar and fear that someone might take me home and hurt me. But she doesn't know what it's like to be a racialized person and be called racial slurs out on the street or be jumped because you look a certain way. And it's those intersections that really made our, our relationship a lot stronger and to be able to openly talk about that and to be like, okay, you, maybe you don't understand this racial issue, but I don't really necessarily understand this gendered issue. Um, but to be able to sort of, you know, synthesize that, that really, I think, makes a, a relationship stronger. And the ability to communicate and accept, you know, when you're, when you're right or when you're wrong. And I think someone like Elise in the play, it takes her a really long time to accept that. And she doesn't really accept that till the end, when people are telling her, like, well, 
you're a white person appropriating, you know, so. In a mixed race relationship, it's hard, but it's also, it can be easy, yeah. That's interesting, that idea of, of her accepting something later on. What about things we maybe see or don't see early on in relationship? When cu couples are dating, uh, it's probably not uncommon to identify habits or characteristics in the other person that might annoy or disturb. How, how common is it, do you think, for people to enter a relationship assuming that those kind of differences can just be smoothed out or, or they will disappear oh, yeah. with time? <laughs> Dang. <laughs> well, yeah, because the follow-up question to that is, like, does it do these things actually break up the relationship? Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I, I, sometimes you enter a relationship and you, you're not really sure what's gonna happen. It's kind of, but you can't be afraid to enter a relationship because you're not sure what's gonna happen. I guess that's the beauty of life. It's open-ended. Mm -hmm. However, there are certain things that maybe, so the question is usually posed, that question is posed to the partner. It's like their partner does something that annoys you, but really it should be like, why does it annoy me, this individual? So. If, for example, your partner just is really bad at texting you back or calling you back, well, why does that really trigger you? Why does it affect you? And why is it that you can't communicate with that with your partner? And then let's, I'm just spinballing here, spitballing here, but let's say it's actually that, you know, you have high anxiety and you just need to know where your partner is. And that actually is kind of, kind of true to my family because my parents would always be messaging me. It's like, it's 12.05, where are you? I'm like, I'm, I'm walking home, I'm almost there. And, and, and then I remember that at times when my friends are like, you know, when, when I was younger and my girlfriend was out, I, ha I would have mad stress and anxiety. I didn't know where, where they were. I'm like, I just need to know that you're okay. And my parents were like that too. And then you go back and back. It's like, well, they had high anxiety too. Yeah. Like my dad disappeared, like my mom disappeared. So people were just like, where are they, you know? Um, so yeah, so it's really being in this, the, to be able to reflect that about yourself. And it's like, is it really this thing that annoys me? That, is it my partner's fault? Is it actually something that I have to work on that I can you know, help my partner and we can communicate and get over that? But I think sometimes at the end of the day, maybe there are actual moral foundations that are sort of, that do make or break uh, a relationship. And I know that we said we're not gonna get political, but for example, if someone is like very, you know, right now in what's going on in the world with the pro-choice and pro-life, it's like those can become really big factors that in the end, it's not just the belt pro-life, pro-choice. There's a lot more that goes behind that and, and your underlying values and what you think uh, are your morals. And so that time, it, it kind of just creates these clashes that in the end, maybe they can't be reconciled. Um, but yeah, that's, like, that's kind of where I'm at. So, I mean, you kind of have to find someone that sort of has an underlying foundation like yourself. <laughs> but I don't know, it's like, you know, if you date your, Opposites attract, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you don't want to date yourself. <laughs> I think you've got a really uh, uh, fertile field uh, for your PhD, and uh, I wish you luck in the, best yeah. of the rest of your dissertation. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Alfredo Garcia. Our next guest is Stephen Lobo, who was born in Toronto, trained at the Drama Center in London. Uh, Stephen's based in Vancouver now. He divides his time between theater, film, and television. His credits include Jesus Hopped the A-Train, a self-production at Performance Works, Travelers, Arctic Air, and Little Mosque on the Prairie on TV. Kindred marks Stephen's Belfry debut. Please welcome to the Belfry Before Play, Stephen Lobo. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Oh, absolutely. What Can, great talks those were. That was, that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. We might just bring your mic yeah. in a bit closer, uh, if, if you don't mind, Steve. What, what, what can you tell us about your history as an actor? When did you first know you wanted to be an actor? Um, I was taking uh, environmental science courses at U of T. Um, I wasn't doing very well at them, <laughs> um, and we had to take a, a we had to pick an elective, yeah. and I chose I chose theater um, just as something to do. I thought it would be, you know, uh, something that I can get my grade point uh, average up, and you know, um, but immediately I started feeling all uh, kind of excited about it and tingly about it and 
um, my energy started, I st just this one little th uh, theater course started consuming a lot of my time and mental space and, um, and I had a, a wonderful professor who, um, yeah, that was, she was, her name was, her name is Anna Miglia Risi. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, uh, from that, that's where things got going. That was the first time I ever, um, took a theater class or anything like that. And it took off from there. You went to the drama center in London. Yeah. From there, I, I, I knew that, that that was something, uh, I wanted to pursue. Um, there was some early, um, rejection. I started taking theater courses downtown. Um, I knew I needed to get experience or training or something. Um, but in the face of some, a lot of early rejection, it kind of, it kind of, um, it taught me, I, I, I learned from that. I was like, oh boy, in the face of this rejection, I still want to really do yeah. it. So I better get serious about it. And that's when I decided to go to, 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 to theater school, yeah. And what was that like? What was that experience like for you? Um, it, well, going to theater school in in London was uh, just a, a what a uh, just a privilege to be immersed in a city with so much theater happening. Yeah. Um, I, I I I have so many memories of performances and productions that will that inspire me to this day that that I that will stay with me. Uh, for a long, long time. You really are immersed um, in it in London, aren't you? Yeah, it was just, yeah, it was, a, you're immersed in a city with so much history and um, you felt endlessly inspired by that, you know? Um, at the same time, the, and, and it was a three year conservatory training at the Drama Center. The nickname for the Drama Center was the Trauma Center. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's uh, it left a mark, it's left some, some marks yeah. for sure. They, they, um, they weren't uh, touchy feely or, or or soft with your feelings all the time in the feedback. No, <laughs> no, they were not. No, no. There's, yeah, no. There's, uh, there was definitely some some. Uh, I mean, there was one time after, well, in our first year. So I was a little bit older when I started. I was 27 when I started uh, drama center. So I came in with like I don't know. I was I, I guess I thought that I had some experience and wisdom to, you know, and, and felt a little bit um, like a big brother to, you know, these, these young, these, you know, these young, impressionable, innocent, young, unexperienced kids. Yeah. And so they, they, you know, I think they needed to whip that out of me. Yeah. And they put me in my place really quick. Uh, after my first, after one of our first showings to the faculty, the, the head of the department, the head of the school, came out and started to give us feedback. Um, and everybody's just sitting there with bated breath, just listening, hanging on every word. And he started a sentence that I will never forget, um, which was, um, however, there's one person in this room who will never be an actor. <laughs> and everybody was just frozen, can't breathe. Except me, though. I was like, someone's going down. <laughs> and it's probably that guy. Uh, and yeah, and um, yeah, and he says, and that person is Stephen Lobo. <laughs> and then he moves on. And everybody's just, you know, there's a, it's like there was a, it was so interesting because it was like there was a dead body. <laughs> and that dead body was me. Yeah in the room and everyone is just ignoring it and going, okay, please don't say my name next. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, that was very interesting. <laughs> that, that, that's a great story. But, but take me back to Stephen Lobo that day or maybe later that day. I mean, did you think, oh, I'm done, I've done it. Or did, I mean, did it sort of stiffen your resolve or just make you think, why am I here? Oh man, it was, yeah, it was, a, well, it was, first it was just stunned and you're just like, is this, did that, it was a, it, is that really happening? What, what? What? What do you go from there? I'm just started, right? And I've yeah. worked so hard to get yeah. to there. So you just stick around. You yeah. just start keep showing up to a place where you're told you have no place at. It's very strange. And, and so, so the, and, and in terms of that day, you know, it's just, for the rest of the, 
the rest of my class is just, like, there was no words. There was the most I got was Lindsay Partington was sitting right in front of me and then like maybe five minutes later, she kind of just did one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the most, I, but then, then at the pub, you know, yeah. you, walk, you walked into the pub and it was this, <laughs> it was ecstasy. These people, like everybody was just hammered on this event that happened, this thing that happened. And um, I mean, and to this day, that story is, it's become, I mean, it's taken over. Like that's, that's the story as I remember it. But like when I talk to people who have heard the story, it was like the lights were flickering and, you know, <laughs> Christopher, there was hellfire and, and, he, and, he, and he pointed at me with like, and, you know, lightning was, um, but I, yeah, and it felt like that, but it was actually very, it's very simple. Yeah. Happened. But yeah, you just, you just, I just keep showing up and I yeah. think, you know, it, it did, it did, it, it humbled me and you know and it, and it did you know he some of the other faculty said there was there's method to his madness and he and and um that he did it because i i don't know why he did it that, that he f felt i could handle it or that i needed that and it was probably yeah true to, to all of that yeah well he was wrong anyway i mean you, you've you've <laughs> been an actor uh, in theater, television, and film, and and w what's your point of view on uh, the difference between the three? I, I wonder. I, I'm not going to ask you to name a favorite, although go ahead. But, but what what are the main differences for you as an actor? Um, well, kind of what we were talking about before. Um, when if the audience thinks something is funny in theater, you hear their response. Um, where is you know, if you're doing that is something that's supposed to be funny in film or TV and someone laughs, yeah. you can't use that take. Yeah. So you have to be, you have to be quiet. Um, and sometimes, so sometimes you don't, you really don't know what you've got in the can. You don't mm -hmm. know what you have, if it works, um, until it's all pieced together and shown to an audience a year after you, you shot it, you know, on, on a film and TV set. Um, there's something really uh, joyful and beautiful about, you know, we're gonna, like Lauren was saying, we're gonna, the audience is gonna come in very shortly and, and, and give us that, that, those last adjustments. Um, and we can, um, within Lauren's vision, as actors, we still have the potential to, to, to uh, go back and pursue those goals, and uh, for someone who is eternally dissatisfied with everything I do, um, there's a there's a joy in that pursuit, you know. And yeah, that must be a difference. Uh, I mean, I'm just imagining the run of a play, and you, your perfectionist self, getting to work on something you're not quite happy with, versus once it's been mm -hmm. edited into a, a TV episode or, or a film. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, do you go back and watch your, 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 your filmed self? Or, and, and if so, more than once? Or, or how? So, sometimes I do. I, sometimes, and, I, and I wouldn't even call it a, per, a perfectionist. It's just the, it's in the pursuit of it. Okay. It's, um, yeah. um, and so, yeah, sometimes the, looking at the final product of a film or TV production can be a little intimidating because there's not a damn thing you can do about it yeah. anymore. That's right. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I watch, I do watch. It's more as in to celebrate that period of time with the other people that mm -hmm. were involved and, and to see all the different elements of the, the work that the, the costume designers and the set deck people did and all that hard work and to see it all come together and, and then yeah and then watch myself like this as, as, <laughs> as, as, as yeah. when I'm on the screen yeah. What about Mo your character in Kindred what can you tell us about him and how does he fit into the story of the play? Um, yeah we meet Mo at the, at the beginning of uh, the, at the beginning of the play he's at the end of his at the end of his marriage um, and he is having a uh, he is not willing to accept that 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 reality that truth he's doing everything he can to try and prevent the dissolve of his family of of that family unit 
and um, the, the the idea of any kind of reality beyond that is not something that he 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 can even fathom at that point. So, uh, how does someone like that? Um, how does that someone like that move on? I, I think uh, that's really the question. With we're all faced, we all come up against um, losses and 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 kinds of traumas and um, how we move on from that. Um, is yeah it's you know we can it's very easy to deflect and blame um and become a potentially a jaded bitter person or we can look inward and potentially grow and and change and evolve in and and, and yeah so mo kind of lives in that kind of area what, what, what do you find most rewarding about the role or, or playing mo um well, he's a lot of he's a wonderfully flawed character. So it's a it's a lot of fun to play. Um, the playwrights given this character wonderful, different types of scenes, all, um, a few that scare the bejesus out of me. Um, but you know that there's 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 a lot of joy in that. There's a beautiful arc to this character, and it's uh, it's real privilege to play. And what about the story? What, what does it say to you about uh, love and marriage and parenting today? Um, well, I guess we live in a, a divorces are very, very common. Um, I think we, we, and people are, I know a lot of people who are coming out of a, a divorce or questioning whether or not um, a marriage is something worth pursuing, whether or not even monogamous relationships is an achievable goal or should be even something that we want to achieve. Um, and um, well, I think what this play suggests is that if there's two people who fit, who are on the same level of uh, growth, of the same, same level of self-awareness and are willing to, to give, to give love, to, to invest in something that is bigger than themselves, that there's real, there's real hope and power in that. And, 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 and I think the plan, and beyond that, the play suggests that I think if, if people can give, can give that to not just potentially a partner, but to their community, to their, mm -hmm. to society, to, um, yeah, that that there's that there's a that there's a power that that you receive as well from that. That's that's uh, that's bigger than the sum of its parts, and, and in that act of service, which I think is is quite. There's a lot of hope in that. Mm -hmm. I know it's a busy weekend, and and you've got a long day ahead of you. But let me just ask you finally, what it's been like rehearsing during the pandemic. I mean, does it feel back to normal, or or is it? I mean, is it a whole added weight on things still? Um, I think we're just, we're, it hasn't really affected me that much. We're just getting on with it. Um, the Belfry has like really good, strong uh, COVID protocols in place. I, I'm um, tested twice a week, as is everybody in the cast. Um, so, and, and, and rehearsing a play, it's a very immersive um, process to begin with. So we're all essentially bubbled up mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and... Um, I guess the, the only um, the, the the fear is is like the, I don't want to be the one to get it and sh and shut the shut the show down. So I just on the days off, which I'm just being a little bit more careful and throwing the mask on and keeping my distance. And yeah, that's a bit of added pressure for everyone, isn't it? But, yeah, you do. Yeah, you don't want to be the yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be the one. <laughs> God. <laughs> well. I want to thank you again. It's been great oh to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Stephen Lobo is playing Mo in Kindred. 
Our final guest is Siobhan Graff, a Fairfield resident here in Victoria who is an uninvited occupier on the lands of the Lekwungen peoples for 30 years. She's grateful to be part of an intentionally relational blended family. Siobhan has spent her career in the early years field and currently works as a community pedagogist with the Early Childhood Pedagogy Network. Please welcome Siobhan Graff. Thank you. Can you tell us a, a bit about your role as a pedagogist? Actually, I should have confirmed the pronunciation of yeah, pedagogist. Yeah, that's right. I got that one right. Yeah, and, and the journey that brought you to the Early Childhood Pedagogy Network. Mm -hmm, sure. So um, you are saying it correctly. Okay. Um, pedagogist is the term that Canadians have adopted. It's um, inspired by the Italian Reggio Emilia Pedagogista. Um, and... Uh, the role, really, of the early childhood pedagogist. So I worked for 30, almost 30 years in frontline childcare. And um, the role of the pedagogist is a little bit different. We come um, to the work with a lens. We're part of a project that is to support educators. Um, and so I go into centers and I um, provoke and enact um, situational, dialogical, transformative um, curriculum projects that are collaborated with the children and the educators. Yeah. No. And what, sorry, and I'll, I'll say what drew me to that is just having been in the field for a really long time and um, I would say about 10 years ago I had a friend that did a master's thesis on cultural safety um, in the school district and when I read that um, it really um, just became so apparent to me that the work um, needed to start way before school. Ah. And um, as someone in the early years field, um, I think what draws me to the pedagogy network is, um, I'll sort of lean on Angela Davis a bit here, but this idea of um, a different world, a world that can um, resist these hierarchies that um, you know have separated us, that um, have impacted education and and I, I should have started by saying that you know I can never really speak about um, my work in the early years without acknowledging that um, it, you know I do this work on the lands of people who have um, beautifully and meaningfully um, been raising and teaching children for thousands and thousands of years prior to contact and that you know the colonial agenda um, violently disrupted that and so working in the early years and being influenced um, in this Eurocentric development um, implicates me every day um, in that and and so my desire is to disrupt that to, to think carefully about how we can create more livable worlds um, and, and children who we don't even know what the future is going to look like. What are the, who are the citizens that we need to live well with, you know, in multi-species ways? And, and perhaps, if I, if I have this correct, you're uh, disrupting the traditional uh, definition of a family. Uh, uh, mm. Can you tell us about your personal yeah. background regarding intentionally relational blended families? Yeah, so um, I've been married to my husband uh, for 18 years, and I came into a family of uh, three co-parents who were working really well together. Um, my husband's first wife had since had a, a new female partner, who's her wife now. Um, and having worked in childcare for so many years, I had seen so many family, um, you know, going through processes of family reconfiguration and breakdown, and. And so I observed a lot of ways that that um, was hard, um, ways that people um, were really challenged to do that kindly. Um, I saw the ways that it impacted children when it wasn't done in healthy ways. And so I was just so impressed by these three people who seemed to just parent together and there, there was no animosity. And um, so, you know, when I came on board, um, <laughs> so to speak. Um, one of the things that we did early on is we decided that we would have a family mission statement and, and, and it was about the fact that we all four of us came from different kinds of backgrounds. Um, I, w in, I was the only person in the parent group who um, had been raised like in a Christian household so I, I had some um, you know things that had impacted the values my parents imparted. And, but that was my experience, and yet we were 
co-parenting from very similar values places. So the children were involved in that, but it was just about us creating um, some intention around how we wanted to be with each other, how we wanted to be um, in our community and globally kind of thing. And it was about, um, because you know, when you have two different households, sometimes rules are different or expectations are different, but the values behind them were always the same. And I, we felt like that would ground the children in understanding what our values were. Um, it sounds to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Siobhan, but it sounds to me like, if it's not the primary motivation, one of the primary motivations was the welfare uh, of the kids. Is that fair to say? Yeah, 100%. Like, I think that, um, you know, when I met them, you know, my husband had been a stay-at-home parent, so other than the um, parental leave um, when his first wife was home with the babies, and at that time it was only six months, he had been home with the children for nine months, so he, he had an equal relationship to the children, um, I would say, in terms of care providing. And, um, yeah, I mean, I just, everything that we did was about, um, you know, not it, always there's challenges, but how do we make this as, as conflict-free for the children? How do we make it so they don't feel like they're having to choose sides or make choices or, you know, little things like, it, you know, you get to take your stuff with you when you go from home to home, you know? It's not like this, this goes at this house and this belongs here and so-and-so bought that jacket or, you know, so just little things where we wanted to make sure that they, A, saw that conflict um, or relationships could shift and change and that you can work through that and communicate through that, um, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about your uh, Instagram account, or maybe the story mm. behind it, rather? You, you're on Instagram as Third Mama. What, what's the yeah, story well, it's that? sort of self-explanatory, because yeah. yeah. I, came, I came on board, and I was the third mom, and you know, we used to joke that there, our kids' like, fingers would get worn down to the nubs on Mother's Day projects. Um, <laughs> but um, it, yeah, I, I mean, in the beginning, I made a joke about being the third mom, and my youngest son, who was very um, into the Olympics at the time, was like, it's OK. Hey, you still would get like a bronze medal. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm still a contender, even though I'm third. <laughs> what, what about that famous phrase that uh, Hillary Clinton popularized, it takes a village to raise a child? I mean, does that resonate with you in your family context? And do you think it, 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 it's got a, an application to blended families in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I mean, and I can't, I, I don't know that I remember who said it, but I also read somewhere, um, somebody said it also takes a village to harm a child. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that is really profound. Um, and, you know, I think that children need all the love and support they can get. And so if we can just put aside our egos and our, um, you know, and I, I have to say, like, I, I want to be really honest that even though it probably sounds like we have this family that is without tension or complication, that's not true. It's just that we, we're intentional at, at doing our own work um, and figuring those pieces out. And I, ha I would honestly say that if any of the roles had been different, like I don't know if I could have been as gracious to allow two other women to mother my children as um, Sandy was. Like I, I'm blown away by her grace um, always. And so, but yes, I think that the more support that parents have, the more support that children have, um, that can only be a good thing. Now, in, in the play, Kindred, uh, one of the characters says that children tend to side with the parent who stays in the family house, as opposed to the parent who moves out. W have you found that to be true? Any thoughts on that? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's certainly, I wouldn't say it was really true in our situation, because, you know, we had keys to each other's homes, and we celebrated holidays together, so... Um, you know, but I have observed where, you know, I think the familiarity of the family home, again, I think it just really depends on the context of, of the relationship with the children to each of the parents. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of complexities. And, you know, we also had the, I, I came, both of the stepmoms came into the marriage marriages with no children of our own, which absolutely adds a whole other layer of complexity when you've got multiple people co-parenting in multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, not in our situation, it was, it was okay. 
th there can be so many complexities. Uh, you know, uh, having two homes, as as you mentioned, splitting vacation time. Although it sounds like you vacation or, or had holidays together, uh, leaving friends behind sometimes when staying with one or the other parent. H how do you think parents can address the challenges? And you must have seen this so many mm -hmm. times as an early childhood educator uh, that, that they face and their children face. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think first and foremost, like you really have to listen to your children. Like you, you really have to be able to hear um, what's happening for them. I think you have to, um, and you know, you might not be able to change anything, but to honor their feelings, to say like, I get that this is hard. Um, and I think you have to really, you know, parents have all the power, right? So it's like we get to decide who goes where, when, and all of those, and that is so hard. I, I would not want to every four days pick up my stuff and go to another house. And so, you know, those are the challenges to work through. I say 100% that counseling is important. Um, you know, my early on, um, our ch we got approached by CBC was interviewing a few different kinds of families and um, we didn't end up being in this on this program but they came and asked us some questions and the children came up with a list of things that parents shouldn't do uh -huh. or that they should or shouldn't do and I can't remember them all but they were things like don't send messages to each other through your children mm -hmm. and these were things that they had observed their friends uh -huh. for parents doing um, don't say that certain things have you know let my stuff be my stuff um, don't speak unkindly about the other parent, like that kind of stuff, right? And those are hard things to do when you're in a place of hurt. I mean, we fail each other in our humanity all the time. And so I also think like owning that and being able to say to your children, like, you know what? I, I take that back. I shouldn't have said that or, you know, yeah. So I think you have to do your work. I think you have to help your kids. I don't think there's any shame like, like Alfie was saying, like, Toxic masculinity, I'm so lucky because I think part of what has made us successful is that my husband doesn't have a lot of that toxic masculinity um, stuff. And so he's a very gentle person. And, um, you know, I think that he, um, you know, I mean, I think he would say that he may have felt differently had his wife remarried a man. Like his ego may have um, been impacted in a different way. But um, I think it's just really being in touch with what's going on for you and, and allowing that open communication, yeah. It, it's good to hear about your specific example. I appreciate you being willing to share it, and, and it's interesting, the specifics. Have you come across other families that have renegotiated or rearranged or whatever in, in different models that, that you think mm -hmm. are also good examples? Yeah, I mean, I think it's happening more and more. Like, I when we, when we were doing it, I feel like we got met with a lot of, like, whoa, that's, like, kind of weird and... and interesting and good and <laughs> you know um, but I think that I see it happening more and more we certainly had friends along the way who we saw doing it well that were um, doing it similarly um, I see it way more on social media now like uh, Glennon Doyle who's a writer and she's married to Abby Wambach a um, Olympic soccer player they really demonstrate her and her ex-husband um, how to do family well um, and so I think it's happening more and more. And I think Alfie's on to something where I think that I really hope this next generation of kids, like as we get more, um, and we really try to address these ideas about gender and how people have to be in the world, um, that that can um, just impact how people are in families and relationships, how, what, how we respond when relationships transform and transfigure in a different way. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think there are people out there who are doing it well. If, if, I want to ask you finally about technology, which may seem like a, a, a sort of an unusual element to bring into this, but I can't help but wonder with dating apps and, and Instagram accounts and, and so much more uh, access to just seeing the, the different ways people are living, if you think it, it changes it. And dating apps in particular, which are so foreign to me, I can't even tell you, but, and maybe many other people in this room, but mm -hmm. every young person I know, it's just part of their upbringing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or their youth. Um, hmm. Well, before I say that, there's one thing I just want to go back to because I, I, this is really important to say and I might have alluded to it, but I just really want to say that um, when you were just talking about that, about parents doing it well, is that, you know, we, the four of us, recognize that we come from a place of privilege with four very well-resourced parents. And um, that is not the case for many, many people in the world. And so, you know, it doesn't mean that if you are not doing what we're doing or trying, you know, that, that, that you're doing it wrong. Everybody, I think, is 
trying their very best. Nobody starts out trying to make your life's child difficult or whatever. Um, as for online dating apps, I have friends who are my age that are engaged, you know, use them. Um, and I will just say, thank you, my love, <laughs> for taking me <laughs> off the table and, uh, or whatever you want to call it. I'm just so relieved to not have to participate in that scene at all. It's like so intimidating to me. Yeah. And I mean, I think, <laughs> Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, I just think it is really interesting because, I mean, people can portray themselves a certain way, I guess, on social media that may not be accurate. But I, I do also think there's way more than for you to assess a person's personality while you're online. But I will just, the women that I know that are dating at this age, like, it is rough. It is rough. And, it, and it's rough because of some of the things we talked about. You know, I think that men of, of my generation are still really battling with the, these, uh, these things that we all were kind of encultured into around Matt, what it means to be a man in the world. And, um, and most women I know are like looking for some guys who are willing to do their work and, and be sensitive, and that's hard. It's been very interesting talking to you, Siobhan. It's so good to meet you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Siobhan Graff, thank you for coming to Before Play, everyone. And, uh, and you heard it from Lauren, the director. You are a part, an essential part of uh, all the productions. So if you can, it would be great. And the box office is open on the way out. Yes. Thanks for coming, everyone.